Hello everyone, welcome to yours and my favorite part of the week. That's right, it is your online general psychology lecture and I'm here to walk you through the hottest topics in memory. Alright, so let's jump right into it. And as always, beginning with the basic definition of memory, uh, we're going to define it as the retention of information over time. Now interestingly, our memories are surprisingly good in some situations and some and surprisingly bad in others. This is known as the paradox of memory. But we're going to walk through times when our memory is good and times when our memory is bad. And uh, uh, alongside kind of different types of memory and the mechanisms uh, both cognitively and biologically involved in memory. The one critical aspect of memory is top-down processes. Our brains have evolved to streamline processing of memory. One key example is that we fill in the gaps of mis missing information using our experience and background knowledge. Psychologists call this phenomenon top-down processing. We can contrast top-down processing with bottom-up processing. Our brain processes only the information it receives. It constructs meaning from it slowly and surely by building up understanding through experience. For example, lyrics in Taylor Swift's song Blink Space. Um, one lyric uh, sounds like, gotta love, our star our, gotta love our Starbucks lovers, or gotta, got a lot of Starbucks lovers. The real line, however, is got a long list of ex-lovers. But our top-down processing leads us to think lots of Starbucks is a more logical parsing of the words. So kind of the idea here is that memory at all times is being processed through um, when you're using this top-down approach, um, uh, your uh, um, uh, history at interacting the world is your lifetime experience, your background knowledge, and that history and background knowledge allows you, allows you to kind of take shortcuts through life because you kind of know what to expect so then, therefore, your brain can kind of fill in the gaps of missing information. This allows for a kind of a quicker streamline, streamlining of, of uh, kind of memory, of processing information around you. And as kind of talked about in previous lectures, our brain is kind of a little bit lazy. It's looking for shortcuts, an easy way to interpret information around it because, you know, there's just a ton of information around here and uh, around us at all times. So in top-down processing, again, you're bringing those past experiences um, and background knowledge to the table when processing information. So in the case of lyrics, you know, you're trying to figure out what's going on, trying to fill in the g gaps of what the uh, lyrical uh, a lyric is. Uh, your top-down brain, uh, top kind of the principle of top-down processing uh, uh, suggests that you're going to look for, um, uh, uh, or I should say, kind of lean on your background knowledge. So kind of you have a background knowledge of going out to eat at Starbucks, maybe drink a lot of coffee or something along those lines. So you're thinking, okay, this kind of sounds like something that I'm familiar with, but I'm not exactly sure. So then your kind of brain is going to try and make an educated guess, uh, fill in those blanks of information, in, the, in this case, not knowing the lyrics, based on its past history, um, uh, past uh, background experience, in this case, going to Starbucks a lot. So therefore, the lyric is, when you don't know, gotta love our Starbucks lovers. So our brain, again, kind of using background information to uh, kind of fill in the blanks when it's not sure. The paradox of memory, continuing on, uh, the same mechanisms that serve us well, most of the time can, serve, can sometimes cause us problems. There are amazing feats of memory, such as Rejean and uh, Pi. So memorizing uh, the, uh, the, the Pi, which is the number 3 point, well, you know, infinity, 3 point infinity, with all kinds of um, decimal places, as you can see in the right-hand screen. Well, Rajan uh, um, memorized Pi to the 38,000th, the 311th digit. There's also a syndrome called hyperthymistic uh, uh, syndrome, which is a high level of memory for life events. For example, there's a historical case of someone named AJ who can remember precisely what she was doing on that day. So on any single day, uh, if you ask what were you doing on, uh, you know, January uh, 20th, uh, 1995, you know, uh, AJ would be able to tell you exactly uh, what he was doing that day and kind of just a general feeling of what was going on during that day. So this is kind of obviously a rare disorder. But then the question is, you know, is this disorder, is this disorder kind of a blessing or a curse? Um, you know, it's kind of the idea of forgetting uh, can be beneficial, especially when something is kind of harmful. So kind of just an interesting uh uh, case study to think about and also demonstrates kind of the, the capabilities of memory uh, across uh, different syndromes. Um, now here's just an example uh, that I like to include here, just kind of a list of kind of random words here. Uh, just take 30 seconds here to just try and memorize these words without writing anything down. Jumped ahead a little bit, but now go ahead and try and write uh, as many words as you can within, you know, 20-30 seconds again. 
When you were writing the words down, did you include the word sweet? If so, this is a memory illusion, a false but subjectively compelling memory. Our brains will often go beyond the available information to make sense of the world. It's generally adaptive, but makes us prone to errors. We simply uh, we simplify things to make them easier to remember. In this case, though, our use of this handy heuristic comes with a modest price, a memory illusion. So as you can see in the uh, previous slide, we have a bunch of uh, candies um, and kind of related uh, things that would affect eating too much candy, like heart, uh, teeth, uh, kinds of desserts, pie, cake, etc. Good. But uh, you may have misremembered the word sweet. And again, uh, our brain this is kind of an example of our brain kind of filling in those gaps, a memory that seems plausible, but in this end, you know, um, you know, based on our past information of eating desserts, we know that desserts stay sweet. So again, kind of filling in the blanks, uh, in this case here, creating a memory illusion. That is uh, uh, believing that the word sweet was in that list of words, but uh, it was not. So kind of, again, <laughs> um, this kind of um, filling in the blanks can be adaptive because a lot of times um, um, filling in the blanks works uh, and it's difficult to pay attention to everything at all times. But in other cases, uh, and then specifically in this case, we can create memory illusions. Again, a false memory, but is subjectively compelling um, a memory because sweet fits with the rest of the words in that list. The reconstruction of memory. When remembering, we actively construct memories. We are, we're not passively reproducing them, such as downloading exact coffee, a copy off the internet. We're patching together our often fuzzy recollections with our best hunches about what really happened. When you remember yourself taking a walk, for example, you see yourself as an observer would. But you couldn't possibly have seen yourself from a distance because you, you don't see yourself when you look at your surroundings. You must have constructed that memory rather than recalled it in its original form. So because as, as, so, uh, as stated, memory is not this kind of uh, like a document that you take and then you upload it to your brain and then you download it later. Rather, we're constantly reconstructing memory, putting together uh, fuzzy pieces of information that we have and trying to come kind of the, uh, the best conclusion that we can. Um, based on what uh, we think, uh, what the most likely scenario of what happened is. And as anybody knows who tries to remember things, things get fuzzy over time, and we have to kind of use our best hunches to kind of figure out what actually happened. And one example of the reconstruction, as stated, uh, 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 principle of memory is when you think of yourself walking, you often see yourself kind of in this... Um, zoomed out arena where you can see your entire body and see your entire atmosphere but we obviously don't see that you know you're looking through your eyes you're looking at the world around you you're not seeing yourself zoomed out so this is kind of just an example here that you constructed this memory because we don't visual we don't visualize the world in that kind of zoomed out way but rather you know through our eyes um, now, interestingly, there's a cultural effect in the reconstruction of memory. Uh, Asians are more likely than European Americans to see themselves at a distance in such memories. This results fits with findings that members of many Asian cultures are more likely than members of Western cultures to adopt others' perspectives. Our members are probably shaped by, by not only our hunch and expectations, but also our cultural background. So again, kind of um, if I ask you to remember uh, yourself taking a walk, uh, different cultures will have kind of different reconstructions of that memory with uh, depending how on uh, your cultural background, how uh, uh, much your culture values taking the perspective of other people, um, uh, kind of uh, impacting what it is, the reconstruction of your memory of you taking a walk. With Asian cultures being more likely to kind of take other people's perspective and um, kind of decenter themselves when reconstructing themselves, uh, when remembering themselves taking a walk, taking in more background information, taking the perspective of others, which is kind of a, a general uh, uh, principle of um, a, key, a key component of their culture, which we'll talk about in later courses. But again, kind of the impact, the point here is that the world you live in, the world you experience, your culture, all impacts. Uh, the reconstruction of your memories and your memories in general. There are three uh, systems of memories, the what of memory, there's sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. They differ in terms of span and duration. Span is how much information each system can hold and the duration over how long a period of time that system can hold information. Informo information moves from uh, sensory memory to short-term memory to long-term memory and then back to short-term memory when it's received. 
So kind of the idea, they go in kind of a chronological order. You can think about it going short term to long term. But then when we actively are trying to think of something, try and remember something to try and retrieve information for whatever reason, uh, they, that kind of memory, you know, kind of conceptually speaking, it's moved to short term memory. Now, there are other um, types of memory that researchers debate, but kind of for a, a general site class, um, this is uh, acceptable. And it's kind of the building blocks, at least, of memory. So let's talk about these three subsystems of memory in more detail. I'm beginning with sensory memory. Sensory memory is defined as a brief storage of perceptual information before it's passed to short-term memory. Each sense has its own form of sensory memory. The iconic visual lasts only about one second, while the echoic uh, auditory can last between uh, five and 10 seconds. The, there is something called eidet, uh, eidetic uh, imagery, which can be described as photographic memory. It's possibly an unusually long persistence of ionic image. It often contains minor errors. It's excellent, but not uh, perfect recollections. So sensory memory is kind of just smells, you know, touch memory, uh, hearing things. You're constantly hearing things at all times, but you're not deeply processing that information. That card that went across the street as, you know, you're talking to your friend is not going to be... Uh, uh, or every car sound that, that um, you hear when you're talking to a friend is not going to be placed in your long-term memory. Most of that memory is just gone forever. Um, and it only stays with you like, in your brain, you know, for a second to about 10 seconds. Now, specifically talking about this photographic memory, it is real, but obviously very rare. Um, but even in uh, a kind of photographic memory, um, which may be kind of uh, one theory is that it's just a, a very strong ionic image, which is uh, 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 the visual component of sensory memory, um, there are still errors. It's excellent, but not perfect with uh, recollections. Short-term memory, it's memory system that retains information for limited durations. It's brief in duration, about five to 20 seconds. So kind of pre pretty short, but longer as uh, than uh, sensory memory. We can lose information in our short-term memory due to two different processes. Decay, information fades over time and interference, loss of information due to comp competition with new incoming memory, or incoming information, I should say. Memories get in the way of each other. It's similar to radio signals, and in the fact that they get in the way with each other. So kind of decay, kind of straightforward here, information phase over the time. So someone gives you your tel uh, their telephone number, their name, and then uh, 15 seconds later, or we'll say you know, one minute later, um, the that name, uh, you forgot their name, you forgot their telephone number. And this is because short-term memory only has a limited shelf life. And that um, telephone number or their name had not reached your uh, long-term memory. Uh, it hasn't been properly processed and therefore kind of you forget it. And as stated for interference, you can imagine like radio systems, like uh, you, you can, when you're traveling across straight, straight lines or going into new cities, like the radio station going in and out or different stations kind of playing over each other. And kind of the idea here, uh, researchers argue, is that uh, the, this new information that's coming, the telephone number or their name, is maybe interfering with new information. And then those kind of uh, two memories are going to kind of cross together. Uh, and... Um, and therefore, uh, a person is unable to retrieve those new memories, kind of because the memories are kind of in a, in a way from each other. So new memories kind of just getting away from each other. So maybe you even remember the name, but however, kind of two different memories are going to scramble together and allow, and it's um, kind of interfering. Um, uh, that interference, I should say, uh, kind of prevents you from remembering that person's name. Now let's go into more detail to make this more concrete about interference. Uh, there's retroactive uh, interference, which is new, learning new information, hampers memory for earlier learning. The new interferes with the old. So Spanish, Italian, both are similar languages. You may accidentally use Spanish words when trying to use an Italian word. Versus a proactive interference, which is earlier uh, uh, learning, gets in the way of new learning. The old interferes with the new. So racquetball versus tennis. Knowing how to play tennis might interfere with our, uh, our attempt to learn to play racquetball, which requires a much smaller bra uh, racket. So kind of the idea of retro uh, interference is that, again, kind of this new information is harming your or, you know, interfering with uh, your earlier memory. So the new interfering with old. So let's say you're a native uh, Spanish speaker um, and you're trying to learn Italian. And all of a sudden, one day you're trying to speak Spanish, but you keep mixing up kind of Italian words. So kind of your old um, 
memories of how to speak uh, Spanish being interfered by this new memory coming in, this new Italian, because those words are similar, uh, so you're kind of mixing them up. So they're interfering with each other, that memory of those two words. So in the case of bueno versus however you say it in Italian, bueno, um, uh, the, in your uh, native Spanish speaker, your um, your uh, old understanding of what it means to say good is, is now being kind of interfered with kind of being, uh, uh, which is going to cause you to kind of forget it momentarily how to say good in Spanish because you're learning Italian again, which is very similar versus proactive interference where earlier learning gets in the way of learning something new. So say you already know something. So you're already good at tennis, um, but you're like, you know what? I'm going to play racquetball, but uh, your kind of old skills of playing with tennis, which has a larger bracket is interfering with your ability um, um, to learn uh, racquetball, kind of forming those new memories of how to like, uh, you know, just swing the racket and whatever. So in that case, the old memories interfering with acquiring something new. So we have the new interfering with something old and we have the old interfering with something new. And this is a, and these are kind of the two typical types of interference. Let's talk about the capacity of short-term memory. The span of short-term memory in adults is seven plus two pieces of information. Researchers have argued that the magic number is seven. That is the average digit span of most adults. Some argue that seven is universal, while others say it's smaller, three to four. So if you think about telephone numbers in general, uh, without our area code, our, uh, our telephone numbers are seven. And one reason I believe uh, kind of uh, rooted in this is that the idea that we're able to, again, in our short-term memory for some small period of time, you know, under a minute, around there, uh, a little less, um, being able to temporarily memorize those numbers. Uh, and again, kind of the idea here is that seven is universal, but others argue that it's smaller. However, you could extend our short-term memory span by chunking. Chunking is defined as um, organizing information into meaningful groups. So look at that random uh, configuration of information. Now, what's the sort it in uh, letters that we better understand? So such as USA, GOF, WTF, and LOL. It works with pi digit memorization as well. After two years of training, one na man named SF was able to get his digit span memory up to 79 digits using chunking. His memory span had not increased, but his chunking ability. So again, kind of we have this magic uh, uh, theoretical span of short-term memory that is seven plus two digits, but also we can increase our uh, short-term memory span by using that chunking, you, um, putting those numbers together in meaningful groups, putting those letters together in meaningful groups, and in this case, kind of uh, three or four letter kind of uh, acronyms that we're already familiar with. Again, that background knowledge allowing us to use uh, chunking. So you can improve your chunking skills uh, to kind of, you know, you know, life hack your short term memory. And on the right hand side is kind of something called like a digit span test. And basically what researchers say is I'll present you with these numbers and they say, OK, look at these numbers for 30 seconds. And then uh, they take away those numbers and then they ask you to repeat the numbers uh, back to them after uh, a minute of those uh, digit spans being taken away. So again, one way you can get a uh, hack, this is kind of doing this chunk method, which again, this dude named SF was able to use to get to 79 digits uh, of uh, pi digit memorization. You can extend the duration of short term memory uh, through a couple of different ways. One is rehearsal, uh, which is uh, repeating information to extend the duration or retention in short term memory. Uh, and again, two types of rehearsals. That the first is maintenance rehearsal, which is simply repeating uh, short-term memory information in its original form. So, in the case of a digit test, you can just keep repeating in your mind: nine six five, nine six five, nine six five, or a telephone number, kind of the same thing, over and over in your head. So, just basic rehearsal um, to try and extend the duration of short-term memory. So, because you're constantly thinking about it, it's on your mind. Uh, and so, then you can possibly uh, extend the duration of uh, that. Uh, knowledge of that telephone number and then hopefully eventually make it to your long-term memory uh, versus elaborative uh, rehearsal which is forming meaningful links between short-term memory material we quote elaborate on the stimuli we need to remember by linking them in some meaningful way perhaps by visualizing them or trying to understand their interrelationships for example dog shoe tree pipe key monkey experimenter presents us with the first word in each pair dog tree and uh, key and asks us to remember the second word in the pair. If we use maintenance uh, rehearsal, we'd simply repeat the words in each pair over and over as soon as we heard it. So dog shoe, dog shoe, dog shoe, over and over again. 
If we use elaborate rehearsal, we try to link the words in each pair in a meaningful way. One effective way of accomplishing this goal is to com is come up with a meaningful, perhaps even absurd, visual image that combines both stimuli. So in this case, imagine researchers uh, giving you uh, uh, three sets of words, dog shoe, tree pie, key monkey. If you're going to use the rehearsal, or I should say the maintenance rehearsal type, you would just repeat those pairs over and over. So key monkey, key monkey, key monkey for a minute, and then hopefully 10 minutes from now, you can remember to say key monkey. Uh, versus kind of the elaborate rehearsal, maybe telling, it would involve maybe telling a story in your head about how a monkey needed a key to get to a magical box of bananas or something, or visualizing a dog in a shoe, for example, maybe that's funny to you. Uh, so kind of the uh, difference between kind of elaborating, linking the words together to form some kind of meaningful relationship, or visualizing uh, the end and or visualizing that information versus kind of just mindful or mindlessly kind of just repeating those words over and over again. Key monkey, key monkey, key monkey. Elaborative rehearsal is usually more effective and is consistent with levels of processing model. The more deeply we process information, the better we tend to uh, remember it. There are three levels, visual, phonological, which is sound related, and semantic, meaning re uh, related. Visual is the most shallow, phonological is somewhat less shallow, and semantic the deepest. So kind of the idea here is uh, uh, your memory improves as you think about that information in, um, in, uh, in uh, complex ways. So the more complex you think about it, uh, the more deeply you think about it, the more uh, the higher levels of processing that information is happening at a neurologic level, and the more likely you are to remember it. And as stated, you can remember uh, kind of the information visually, phonologically, and, and semantically. So let's walk through that a little bit. Beginning with visual, it focuses on how the sentence looks. It's vertical, it's in all caps, and it has two words in each. So for example, on the right-hand side with our beautiful Francesca um, uh, poster, dream it, live it, love it. We all know it, into it, 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 it all, it's in, uh, there's three columns, they're all capitalized, and you're kind of just visualizing this kind of uh, image in your head. Phonological would focus on how the words in the sentence sounds. So just say it repeatedly until the word sounds like born gibberish to you. So just keep repeating your mind, dream it, live it, love, love it, just repeatedly over and over again. And then doing so, you know, eventually will make it sound gibberish to you. But that is still one way of kind of rehearsing this, uh, member, uh, this poster by just uh, focusing on how it sounds. Versus semantic, it emphasizes the sentence meanings. So you can elaborate on your own love for Francesca's or hatred for its reduction a reductionist evaluation of life. So again, kind of semantically thinking it through, um, what are the repercussions of dreaming it, living it, loving it? Does this, is that really the key to life? Or is it stupid reductionist um, um, way of looking at the world that is actually telling us nothing and helping no one? Who knows? But the fact that you're thinking about it allows you to, again, process it more and makes it more likely that you remember it. Moving on to long-term memory, it's a relatively enduring uh, store of information. It includes facts, experiences, and skills we developed over a lifetime. It differs from short-term memory in several ways. Seven to nine pieces of information, remember the magic number of seven, versus 500 encyclopedias, which is one proposed um, capacity of long-term memory. It's 20 seconds in short-term memory versus decades for long-term memory. Short-term memory is uh, more based on acoustic, sound of information we've received versus um, long-term memory, which is based on more somatic uh, meaning of information, poodle versus terrier. So if I asked you um, to, or I should say, uh, there, uh, and when you uh, consider the errors made in long-term versus short-term memory, in general, short-term memory is more based on acoustic sounding. So uh, someone tells you something, hey, um, I need to uh, go walk my poodle, you might mistakenly think that they're said, I need to go walk the noodle or something along those lines. It's a short-term memory, and again, the errors are usually uh, uh, acoustic-based. Versus long-term memory, uh, again, you're thinking about things on a deeper level, you're, you're highly processing it, and uh, 20 years later, you can ask someone, um, oh, at the party that one night, was that person walking a poodle or, or a terrier? And you may not be sure, and you might accidentally say terrier. So that's the kind of error you make in long-term memory, kind of the semantic, kind of uh, the uh, information, um, meaning-related uh, errors. Moving on to uh, the primacy and recency effect. The primacy effect is a tendency to remember stimuli presented earliest, now in long-term memory, or something close to it. Recency effect is a tendency to remember the stimuli presented most recently. It's still in the short-term memory. 
You're more likely to remember stimuli that are odd or distinct, such as xylophone or zany. So for example, look at this list of words here and try and uh, memorize it. Again, don't write anything down. Then, after doing so, um, take away the uh, list and try and write uh, as many words as you can remember in about 30 seconds would work. If you're like most people, you probably did a bit better with the earlier words like ball, shoe, and tree than with the words in the middle of the list. Again, this is known as the uh, primacy effect, the, ten the tendency to remember stimuli like words early in a list. If you did, a, if you did better with the later words like cloud, uh, hat, and vase, this uh, is an example of the recency effect, the tendency to remember stimuli later in a list. There's a decent chance to remember the word a xylophone as well, which seems to be something of an oddball in the list. We tend to remember stimuli that are distinctive in some way. Moving on to explicit memory, explicit or declarative memory, it is sometimes called, is the process of recalling information intentionally. It's divided into uh, two types, semantic memory, which is the knowledge of facts about the world, it's knowing what, versus episodic memories, which is re uh, recollections of events in our lives. So you can kind of think about like episodes of our lives, like a soap opera. So the difference are, or one example would be, what year did Gulf Coast State College open? That would be an example of semantic memory question. Or, what year did you start at Gulf Coast State College? Which would be an example of episodic memory. Again, one being about uh, recollection of events in your life versus just some, or versus semantic memory being kind of general facts about the knowledge of the world. In this case, what year did Gulf Coast State College open? Moving on to implicit memories. These are memories we don't uh, deliberately remember or reflect on consciously. Each of us can go through the steps of unlocking our front doors without consciously recalling the sequence of events required to do so. We probably can't tell without reenacting it in our heads or actually standing in front of our doors which way the, turn, uh, the key turns in a lock or how we hold the key in our hands while unlocking the door. There are different types of implicit memory. Procedural memory uh, refers to motor skills and habits, such as riding a bicycle. It's the quote unquote know how to do something. Priming is our ability to identify stimulus more easily and quickly after we've encountered simil uh, a similar stimuli. So for example, if researchers uh, flash the word queen very quickly on the screen, and then an hour later asked, um, you, asked you to fill in the blank of K blank blank blank, you, uh, people who were exposed to the word queen very briefly, an hour later would be more likely to be able to fill in the blank. In this case, K-I-N-G, uh, AKA king. So kind of the, um, that uh, brief presence of the word queen kind of priming you, making you, uh, uh, your brain kind of ready to identify similarly related words, in this case, king. And again, this is kind of a going on more at a kind of unconscious level. These are memory you're not trying to deliver remember or reflect unconsciously. This is kind of things that we remember by just kind of interacting with the world. Again, kind of uh, opening a, t a door, how to use a key, uh, key lock. Um, knowing how to ride a bicycle, and again, this priming example. Again, all occurring at an unconscious level versus kind of deliberate and ex or uh, ex explicit memory occurring at a conscious level. There are three processes of memory. Encoding, getting information into memory, attention plays a role. Storage, keeping information in memory, and retrieval, the reactivation or reconstruction of information from memory. You can imagine this as in kind of a library metaphor. It's not perfect, but it's kind of decent. Uh, so encoding, kind of uh, a librarian, uh, in, uh, catalog, uh, uh, cataloging the information into the library's database. Storage, putting them on a bookshelf, and then retrieval, whenever a librarian needs a book, going to get the book that they need. And kind of elaborating on this a little more, beginning with encoding. Uh, to encode uh, material, we must first uh, 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 give attention to it. Most events we experience are never encoded in the first place. Attention's role in memory, next in line effect. Teacher asks you to tell me a fun fact about you, but you don't pay attention to the person in front of you. Memory for common objects are typically never encoded. So we talked about sensory memory before, where you have all this memory at all times, all kinds of sounds, all kinds of touch, but the super overwhelming, over -major overwhelming majority of this uh, sensory information, you forget. You, and that's because you never encode it. You're not actively paying attention to it, and you're not trying to uh, kind of memorize the sound of that car for the rest of your life when it occurred, you know, whatever. So that kind of speaks to the fact that attention matters and encoding matters. You got to initially like the library and kind of encode that, uh, you got to catalog that book into your memory, AKA this metaphorical library. And one example of this is as stated, attention uh, role in memory. So a classic kind of first day of class kind of thing is where 
uh, we say, okay, students, you have to tell us uh, fun five facts about yourself. And so then you're, everybody uh, is going around the room and say they're going in order from, you know, across or across the front row first and then the second row, third row, etc. Let's well, say you're in the second row, you're thinking that entire time, okay, what are my fun facts? What are my fun facts? What are my fun facts? And you're not actually listening to anybody's fun facts who are going in front of you. And uh, thus, if the teacher asks you, okay, um, uh, um, can you name other people's fun facts? You would probably say, no, I can't. That's because you're not paying attention to, to other people's uh, fun facts. You're focusing and worried about what your own fun facts will be. So again, kind of demonstrating that uh, encoding requires paying attention um, uh, and or otherwise you'll um, never remember it because you never encoded it in the first place. And also in general, memory for common objects are typically never coded. So things we see all the time are less likely to be encoded. So on the right hand side, for example, uh, can you identify uh, which of these uh, pennies is the real penny? It's quite difficult for most people. Moving on to mnemonics. Mnemonics are learning aids that enhance recall. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, for example, and every good boy does fine. Uh, while applicable to almost anything, they depend on existing knowledge uh, store. So um, uh, mnemonics generally work when you kind of have a background uh, knowledge about uh, the uh, topic. So please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Um, if you don't know kind of the order of operations or PINDAS, uh, if you don't know that mathematical background, then that acronym, that mnemonic is going to be meaningless to you. So uh, you can apply mnemonics to anything, but it obviously de it, it depends on um, kind of your existing background knowledge of the mnemonic device that you're trying to uh, encode. Uh, types of mnemonics. Uh, method of uh, loci, or lo loci, I should say, um, uh, locations, uh, relies on inf uh, imagery of places or locations. If you need to recall five things, think about four things you would see on a familiar route to you, something like your apartment or your house. So kind of the idea with this method is, is to say you got to remember four little objects uh, or four objects at a grocery store that you have to buy later, you can imagine those objects on uh, laying on the ground in some kind of common place. So uh, say you're walking home from uh, your work or driving home from work uh, to your house or apartment, uh, and then you can like kind of create a scenario in your head where you're like, okay, bananas are um, right in front of, uh, I don't know, in front of the stop sign in front of my house, uh, the dog food's right in front of the mailbox, the uh, cereals in front of my front door, something along those lines. So basically kind of the idea here is taking those things you need to remember and then placing it, uh, you know, in, in cognitively um, on familiar routes to you as one way of memorizing something. There's also the keyword method, which is typically used in language learning. Uh, these are reminder words. Um, ca uh, casa equals house, for example. Perhaps you can picture a, a guitar case on the roof of your house. Uh, when you think of this image in the company word case, they should help you to retrieve the meaning of casa. So casa meaning house. So say you're trying to memorize this in Spanish. Uh, what you can do is, again, kind of imagine a guitar case on a roof of a house. And therefore, kind of your connector word is case, uh, which then reminds you of house. And that's how many people kind of, uh, one method, I should say, uh, which of people use to learn uh, foreign languages and specifically words. Music, you can put things to familiar songs to uh, memory, or uh, put things to memory to f familiar songs, such as uh, classic melodies in various cultures, one being Pop Goes the Weasel. Uh, researchers have found no initial recall advantage for people who learn the, the uh, name with musical accompaniment, but however, those who heard the sung version required fewer trials to relearn the names a week later, suggesting that learning information put to a melody improves long-term retention. So kind of the idea here is putting uh, the information needed to learn to a song, and researchers have found that although it may not help initial recall memory, it does help uh, uh, possible um, long-term memory, uh, wherein uh, by kind of re repeatedly being exposed to that song, uh, would uh, allow you to uh, relearn that information, um, or I should say kind of just learn that information in general, would help you uh, improve your long-term memory of it. So some people have like uh, in elementary school, like singing the states in the capitals or other songs along those lines. Um, and so research uh, kind of suggests that although you may not have an uh, immediate kind of recall advantage, uh, but over the long term, kind of putting things to songs uh, can help you retain them over time. In fact, kind of my Spanish course in high school would have us kind of sing out the days of the weeks, 
um, in the months of the year, every single class <laughs> to open the class. And to this day, I still remember the days of the week song. Generally speaking, uh, mnemonics can be helpful if we're motivated to practice them on a regular basis. They require training, patience, and occasionally even a dash of creativity. Moving on to storage, which is the process of keeping information in memory. How we store our experiences and memory depends on our interpretation and expectations of them. So going back to the library analogy, is our psych lecture, uh, would that be published in the psychology section or the self-punishment section? Schemas are organized knowledge structures or mental models that were stored in memory. Schemas give us frames of references and allow us to intercept or inter interpret new situations. What happens when you go to a restaurant? It's useful, but tend to oversimplify information. So kind of the idea here is that how we immediately interpret uh, the stimuli around us, our memories, um, and kind of our expectations of those memories impact how we store them in our head. So if we're storing them as a bad event or a good event, or um, that will impact kind of, um, quote unquote, how we uh, store our memories and the likelihood of recalling said memories. Uh, and one kind of example uh, is the schema, which we've talked about before, but kind of the idea here is just that it's kind of a scheme, it's a frame of reference that allows us to interpret new situations. So no matter what restaurant you go to, imagine you went to a restaurant that you've never been to before, uh, you kind of have a general set of expectations that, there, that there's going to be a host, you're going to be seated, they're going to ask for your drinks, then appetizer, then uh, main uh, course, dish. But however, uh, schemas are not always uh, correct. Uh, for example, you may go to a restaurant in a different culture and um, uh, there's kind of different uh, ways that you pay the uh, um, uh, waitress. You may not tip, uh, but kind of the point here is that schemas are useful in general, but at times can oversimplify information and not always be correct. And finally, retrieval. Many types of forgetting are failures of retrieval. The memories are actually still present, but we can't access them. But we can use retrieval cues, uh, I should say that using retrieval cues can help to access information in long-term memory. Hints that make it easier for us to recall information. Ask friend to list words and then give them the category hint. Uh, measuring memory makes the use of the three R's, recall, recognition, and relearning. So kind of the idea here is that although we actually, um, many types of forgetting, I should say, are just failures of retrieval. We actually still know that knowledge, but we can't access them. And one way you can do that is kind of retrieval cues. So you can, um, one uh, example of this is that uh, you can present this list of information on the right hand side and say, okay, memorize this really quickly. And then a minute later, say, uh, ask your friend or yourself to try and uh, list as many words as possible and then say, uh, okay, you've got some words, but then you forget the word metal. And another, and you can, um, and to kind of help you remember uh, that word metal, I could give you a hint, um, uh, such as uh, silver. So that would be your retrieval cue, uh, because it's kind of connected to that, uh, those two words are paired together. That serves as a retrieval cue, which, uh, so by activating that cue, it kind of allows you to access that information uh, in your long-term memory. Because basically when you were memorizing them, you were encoding those two words together. So because they're kind of encoded together at a neurological level, kind of at a neuron level, um, the mentioning one of those words will allow, uh, increase the probability that you'll be able to recall the other uh, word that is paired with. So again, as an example, say you don't remember the word niece and I'm like, okay, there's a word here that has to do with a relative and then you're more likely to say the word niece and thus uh, saying a relative is a retrieval cue. You can measure uh, memory in three different ways. Recall, which is generating previously remembered information. Recognition, selecting previously remembered information from an array of options. And relearning, this is known as savings. How much uh, more quickly we acquire uh, something learned before. So know the, car, uh, know the guitar from high school, start again five years later, relearn quicker. Access memory using a relative amount uh, rather than simple right or wrong. So kind of the idea here is recall is um, an example would be an essay question versus a multiple choice question, which is recognition. So what's the capital of Missouri, for example, uh, would be an example of a recall question or an essay question. That's a tougher question that that, requ that requires you to freely recall, recall the answer without any hints at all. So what is the capital of Missouri? But versus um, a, a multiple choice question, such as is the capital of, of Missouri Jefferson City or Tallahassee or Orlando? Well, in that case, uh, all you have to do is recognize the correct answer. You don't have to freely recall them. 
All you have to do is select the correct answer from a, from a uh, set of options, a set of uh, incorrect answers, and that is much easier. Recall requires generating an answer and then determining if it seems correct. Recognition only requires determining which item from a list seems most correct. Thus, <laughs> and this is kind of understood in, uh, when you're taking a test, multiple choice tests are typically easier than essay uh, uh, tests because uh, the difference, recognition versus recall. Retrieval of specificity. In coding specificity, we are more likely to remember something when the condition present at the time we encoded it are also present at retrieval. There are two kinds, context-dependent learning and state-dependent uh, learning. Context-dependent learning, uh, superior retrieval when the external context of our original memories matches the retrieval context. So kind of the idea here is that uh, the context in which that you remembered uh, the events or whatever it is you were trying to remember matches the context, the environment in which you originally learned that event. So recalling an event is easier when, you recall, uh, when you're uh, trying to recall it in the context that was similar to the place where you first experienced it or where you first tried to remember it. So for example, researchers presented divers with 40 unrelated words while the divers were either standing on the beach or submerged in about 15 feet of water. Researchers then tested the divers in either the same or a different context from which they presented the words. The divers' memories uh, were best when the original context matched the retrieval context, regardless of whether they were on land or underwater. So in this ex uh, experiment, uh, as stated, kind of the scuba divers were either give, given a words to memorize either underwater or on land. And when uh, the scuba divers were tested, they did best on the test, uh, that is kind of recalling those words when their original context, that is either uh, recalling it on, or either encoding it on land or encoding it on underwater, match uh, their original, um, I should say matches where they're trying to retrieve it. So kind of in plainly stated, if a scuba diver initially uh, memorize those words underwater, they're more likely to remember and recall those words when they're underwater versus uh, out of the water or sitting on the beach. So kind of the same thing. Uh, or uh, conversely, if a scuba d diver uh, memorize those words standing on the beach, they're more likely to retrieve those words, to recall those words uh, when they're on the beach versus if they were told to kind of recall those words while underwater. So again, stating here that the context and when you initially encode those words, um, when you're trying to memorize those words, matters uh, in your ability to recall those words. State-dependent learning, uh, superior retrieval of memories when the organism is in the same physiological or psychological state as it was during coding. People with alcoholism uh, who report finding items they lost while drunk if they get drunk again can depend, uh, can extend to moon-dependent learning, wherein it's easier to recall and recognize sad memories when sad, same with happy. So state-dependent uh, learning argues that when you're in the same physiological state, um, uh, or I should say retrieval is uh, better uh, when you're uh, in the same physiological state uh, at which, uh, <laughs> as when you originally coded it. So for example, say you're drunk at a party or whatever, and you're trying to memorize something, or you forgot your keys, or you lost something. And kind of the idea here is, well, <laughs> theoretically, if you got drunk again, you were more likely to remember uh, whatever it is that you were trying to, that you originally encoded or where you put your keys. So because kind of the idea here is that you initially encoded that memory in a specific physiological state. So returning to that physiological state or psychological state would uh, uh, increase the probability of you retrieving that memory. And kind of a similar concept with mood dependent learning, uh, when you are uh, sad, you're more likely to recall uh, memories that are uh, uh, sad. Uh, when you're happy, you're more likely to recall or recognize uh, uh, happy uh, memories. The neural basis of memory storage. Memories uh, of different types of experiences are stored in different brain areas. Uh, one famous psychologist, Carl Lashley, uh, uh, tried to identify where memories were stored in the brain of rats. To do so, he kept removing brain tissue from rats who memorize a maze, but they were always, a, uh, uh, always uh, able to obtain some memory of the maze. So kind of the idea here was that this psychologist asked rats to run a maze, and then he would take a chunk of their brain out. Then he would ask them to run a maze again, 
and then try to take a chunk of brain out. And kind of the idea was how much of this brain of this rat do I have to take away before they forget how to uh, run through this maze in a, you know, a fast way? Uh, how quickly do they, how much brain has to be taken away before they lose their memory of the maze? And what he found out was that no matter how much brain uh, he took away, and you know, as long as they allowed to you know, keep moving, you know, not be dead, uh, the rats always maintain some memory of the maze which suggests that we can't simply point to a spot in our brain and say, there's the memory of my first kiss, because that memory isn't located in a single place like a library book sitting on a shelf. So this kind of shows us the limits of that library metaphor. Instead, as scientists have since learned, memories of different features of experience, like their sound, sight, smell, are almost certainly stored in different uh, brain regions. So our memories are kind of uh, stored across our brain with possibly different aspects of the memory stored in different parts of our brain. Long-term potentiation is the gradual strengthening of the connections among uh, neurons from repetitive stimulation. Many researchers believe our ability to store memories depend on strengthening connections among neurons within networks. So kind of the idea here is that by repeatedly uh, uh, stimulating, um, or I should say, by repeatedly kind of working with sets of memory, we strengthen that connection. So by uh, the more we think about something, the stronger that memory becomes. It's increasing the strength of those neuron connections. Uh, so that's what's going on on a neurological level. And you can even uh, say that with kind of that word matching, that retrieval cue thing, wherein you're memorizing two sets of words. Um, so those kind of the connection between those words are growing stronger at a neurological level. And interestingly, um, sleep is thought to be kind of involved with long-term potentiation. So maybe uh, sleep being linked to kind of increases in long-term potentiation. The long-term, uh, um, a role uh, in, in learning, the hippocampus plays a key role in forming memories. There is, however, no Ingram, the physical trace of each memory in the brain. Memories are diffusely stir, uh, 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 stored together. Uh, kind of the classic model here is the head model, neurons that fire together, wire together. According to Hebb, one neuron becomes connected to another neuron when it repeatedly activates that neuron. Neurons are fed by rich blends of neurotransmitters from form circuits, integrate, integrate sensory information in meaningful ways, and transform our experience of the world into lasting, perhaps even lifelong, memories. So as I said before, there's not a physical, there's not a physical tr uh, trace of memory, there's not one storage place of memory, but rather a collection of neurons firing together uh, thus forming these uh, strong bonds, these very rich neural connections, um, um, which allows us to kind of like blend all that sensory information together to kind of form some aspects of kind of fuzzy memories that's th that we can then later recall. Moving on to amnesia, the most common types are retrograde, that is a loss of past memory, kind of retro, versus interrograde, interrograde, the loss of ability to make new memories. Generalized amnesia is very rare, as, as is sudden recovery of memory. So kind of the idea of losing both, uh, of losing all memory is generally rare. In general, you either have retrograde, that is the loss of past memories, or interrograde, the loss of ability to make new memories. And the classic example of this, Memento, uh, the um, Wolverine, 50 first dates in that case, uh, inability for the, the, I forget if it was the woman or the man, and that uh, 50 first dates, uh, being unable to create new memories. And thus they had to reform the relationship every day. I think it was the woman. The amygdala and hi uh, hippocampus interact to give us emotional memories. The amygdala helps recall emotions associated with fearful events, and the hippocampus helps us recall the events themselves. Memory changes as we age. Children's memories increase in sophistication. Memory span increases with age until uh, about 12 years old, and increase in conceptual understanding. It's easier to chunk information. Also, we develop better meta memory skills. Knowledge, about, or knowledge about our own memory abilities and limitation. A four-year-old versus a 10-year-old predicting how well they will do on a task. So for example, if you ask a four-year-old how well you're gonna do in this calculus, calculus exam, they're more likely to say, yes, I'm gonna do awesome, I'm gonna ace that calculus exam, versus you know, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, they're gonna say, actually, I don't know shit about calculus, therefore I'm going to fail this, uh, this test. So kind of the idea here is that our knowledge about ourself and about our limitations and our abilities uh, develops with age. Alongside a general increase in uh, different types of memory. In this case here, looking at memory span, improving until about age 12. Infant amnesia is, uh, uh, is uh, defined as the inability of adults to retrieve accurate information between two to three years old. 
The hippocampus is only partially developed in infants, and their lack of sense of self are two reasons why it is believed that we are unable to uh, remember information between approximately two to three years old. So we literally don't have the neurological capabilities and also kind of this generalized cognitive sense of self of what am I? Um, this world is acting on me. I'm interpreting the world around me with a kind of understanding of this myself as a distinct being in this other world around me are objects that I can also memorize. So kind of the idea is that cognitive ability has not or in that cognitive recognition has not yet developed alongside kind of a, um, uh, various parts of the brain not being uh, developed yet, thus allow not allowing kind of long-term memory of events that occurred to us before we were two years old. There is no evidence for the use of hypnotic age regression or other techniques to beat um, infantile amnesia. Flashball memories are memories can be more uh, available than any of us could have imagined. Um, uh, flashball memories are defined as emotional memory that is extraordinary, vivid, and detailed. Parts can be wrong, better at where you were when, uh, what you were doing, or who told you. So kind of classic examples of flashbulb memories are um, the Challenger space shuttle blowing up in the 80s, uh, September 11, 2001. So kind of this very extraordinary, uh, vivid detail memory, which parts of it can still be wrong. Um, for example, you're better at, as stated, you're better at knowing where you were than what exactly you're doing, or who told you or who were talking to you at that time. Here's an example. Go ahead and read through this. I'm not going to read this now. Uh, the kind of uh, one example of, of, of uh, flashball memories and how flashball memories change over time. So basically, they ask uh, participants to um, their thoughts on the uh, Challenger explosion um, soon after it occurred versus uh, two and a half years later. And you can see the differences and how those memories change. Implanting false memory, uh, procedures that encourage uh, patients to recall memories that may or may not have taken place. Smash first hit cars. They ask how fast a car crash happened. So for example, researchers showed clips of traffic accidents and asked participants to estimate the speed of the vehicles involved. The clips varied the wording of the question about how fast were the cars going when they were blank each other by inserting different words in the blank like contacted, hit, bumped, collided, and smashed. So basically what happened here is uh, researchers show a car crash video and then the video asks them, okay, how about how fast were the cars going when they were blank each other? And you can either say, uh, how fast were the cars going when they smashed against each other, when they hit each other, when they collided, when they bumped with each other. Interestingly, when the inserted word suggested a greater degree of contact between the cars, participants reported higher speeds. For example, when participants heard the word smashed, they rated the speed as nine miles per hour faster than when they heard the word contacted. In a second study, researchers replicated these findings by using the words hit and smashed and a week later asked participants if they, uh, if they recalled seeing any broken glass at the scene. Compared to those who heard the uh, hit word, participants who heard the smash word uh, were more likely uh, reported that they saw uh, glass. So kind of the idea here is that how you frame that initial memory impacts what you remember. So in the case of saying that the, that the cars crashed or collided, explosion, um, those kind of descriptive words, researchers using those descriptive words influence memory, wherein the more kind of, uh, the, uh, if you use a word that suggests a greater degree of contact, participants are more likely to remember the cars going at higher speed versus saying something like a fender bender, a minor bump, something along those lines, increases the probability that participants are going to remember the car crash as kind of a uh, as slower occur as a kind of a smaller uh, less high speed uh, car crash and as stated um, uh, not only that but a week later if you got the more um, the words that suggested a higher degree of contact you are more likely to report more damage at the scene more glass more you know the flames oil around all those things even though but the important part is that even though the uh, the videos and the um, the images were all exactly the same. The only thing that changed was the initial description of that word, and which again just points to that even though the events are exactly the same, how you initially encode them, how they're described, um, impacts your memory, and this can be manipulated on some level. Event plausibility in recent past can both impact strength of false memories. You won the lottery. So kind of the event, so false memory can happen, but they have to kind of be within reason. If I said, hey, remember when you won the lottery? Well, you're not going to remember that because you're not loaded at the, minute, <laughs> at the moment. You don't have millions of dollars. 
Existing proofs show that it is possible to create memories that are implausible or in, in, impossible. So researchers showed participants ads for Disneyland that featured Bugs Bunny and asked them about seeing Bugs Bunny at Disneyland as a child. 16% of participants said they remembered meeting and shaking hands with Bugs Bunny. Some even remembered him saying, what's up, Doc? The only problem is, is that Bugs Bunny is a Warner Brothers uh, trademark, not a Disney cartoon character. So the memories must have been false. So in this case here, experimenters can just make up an advertisement with uh, Bugs Bunny at, a, at Disneyland and then say, okay, do you remember when you went to Disneyland and saw Bugs Bunny? And interestingly, 16% of participants will say, hell yeah, I met Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. Um, but as we know, that's literally impossible because this Bugs Bunny is not owned by Disneyland. So again, kind of an example of how the suggestibility of researchers can impact and implant false memories. Now, in the real world, there is uh, this can be seen through a weak correlation between eyewitness confidence and their testimony and their accuracy. Um, eyewitness confidence or eyewitness testimonies are less accurate when they are observing others of different races, they are witness, uh, the witness has talked to other witnesses, or the observed situation is stressful, such as threatening weapons involved. One reason for this is weapon focus. Um, so if... Um, in the presence of a weapon, of a violent event, an eyewitness testimony may be less reliable because they're focused on the danger, that weapon, um, that gun, whatever, which is going to distract uh, the encoding of that memory because obviously they're focused on not dying from that weapon. So in general, uh, eyewitness confidence, um, the, there's a very weak correlation between the, the uh, eyewitnesses' testimonies and their accuracies, um, but there are certain factors, as stated, that can impact and decrease the accuracy of eyewitness testimonies, such as race, uh, talking to other people, and thus having your memory influence, and again, kind of this, um, the situation in which the uh, uh, encoding in occurred. Which brings us to the Innocent Project, which was founded in 1992 at the Cordozo School of Law in New York. It works to exonerate the wrongfully convicted through DNA testing and reforms to the criminal justice system. In 1989, the first DNA exoneration took place. There have been 367 people in the U.S. Uh, have been exonerated by DNA testing, including 21 who were served time on death row. 69% involved eyewitness misidentification. 42% of those cases were cross-racial uh, misidentification, and 28% involved false confessions. So this is a project committed to with the advent of like DNA uh, technology, going back, reviewing okay, old cases, and what they found literally is hundreds of cases in which that person literally could not have committed that crime. And even though in about 70% of those cases, there were eyewitness testimony identifying that person as the perpetrator of whatever crime. But again, DNA evidence finding that, no, that is literally impossible. So again, they've got, this project has demonstrated uh, and has literally saved the lives of countless people uh, who would have otherwise been convicted and possibly sentenced to death um, because of some combination of eyewitness um, um, uh, t testimony. And obviously other factors working against poor and racially um, disenfranchised groups. And finally, children are highly vulnerable to suggestions to recall events that did not happen. Uh, repeated questions about a topic makes it more likely that they will say it happened. So in general, talking to a young child, uh, children are highly vulnerable to suggestions. So if you can say, okay, remember when Johnny stole the cookies? And initially they may say, no, he didn't steal the cookies. But if you keep re-asking over and over and over again, do you remember when Johnny stole the cookies? Each time you ask, um, kind of the uh, increase of the likelihood that, that they will say it's ha it happened because it's general, again, uh, children are highly vulnerable to suggestions. So kind of repeatedly asking them uh, those questions and kind of the way you frame questions, children are very sensitive to and are uh, very prone to committing uh, errors uh, when trying to recall memory. All right, everyone, that's all for this week. Thanks so much for uh, listening uh, and I hope you all have a great week. Thanks, bye.